Casey and I both have this this sort of passion around um, being able to help marketers and businesses break free from the the sort of duopoly of Google and Facebook, right? So those two companies own and control the overwhelming majority of uh, advertising spend on the on the internet, uh, which is becoming the majority of all ad and marketing spend in the world, and also. Uh, they own and control a ton of how people think about how to do digital marketing. So, you know, whether that's, you know, I'm creating content so it ranks in search engines, I'm, you know, promoting things on social media. And one of the tactics that has really fallen by the wayside is thinking outside of those platforms, realizing that there are, you know, communities like this one that, that, there are events and webinars and podcasts and uh, press sources and journalists and newspapers, old school and new school, and email newsletters and websites and social accounts, all of which are influential in their various spheres to various people, but they are relatively inaccessible to marketers because there's just no way, no reasonable way to figure out what does my audience pay attention to. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to a, a very special live stream here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. Now, I do need to call out the elephant in the room before we start, and that is that I sound like a drag queen who's been out on a three-day bender, and uh, you'll be pleased to know there's no COVID here. Uh, however, I am recovering from what is possibly the worst head cold and chest cold I've had as an adult. Very boring, and I won't, I won't bore you with all the details, but I just need to call it out. Um, I haven't been out on a bender, and at the moment, I'm not a drag queen. Um, not to say that that hasn't happened in the past or might not happen in the future. Uh, however, uh, so that is why I sound a bit raspy, and if I have to mute myself occasionally and cough and splutter, then please bear with me. Uh, however, I wanted to get out. This is the first time I've been in the office for nine days. I wanted to get out of bed and come here and do this live stream uh, today because we have an amazing topic, we have an amazing guest, we're having all sorts of technical problems too, so it could all turn to shit very quickly, but we're going to soldier on and uh, what I would like to do now is introduce you to uh, someone who I've been following for a very long time. I'm a big fan of his work and his hair. Please welcome Rand Fishkin to the stage. Hey Rand, are you there my friend? I am, yeah, yes. thanks for having me Try. Excellent. Thank you for joining us and thanks for uh, soldiering on through the technical problems that we seem to be having here. Uh, it's a little bit uh, clunky, it's a little bit glittery, but uh, we'll make it work. Now, for those that don't know, um, who I, I, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, while I was in the shower, Rand, I was thinking about you, and I was thinking about uh, <laughs> the first question that I want to ask you is, um, how did you get into the whole you know, we'll talk about moles and your journey and, and Spark Toro and stuff, but how did you get into the journey of, of like um, marketing and communication and why does this matter? I mean, you know, we, we, I was watching some Ricky Gervais videos recently, right? And we have like, we're dead for billions of years. We're alive for like maybe 80 years and we're dead for billions of years. And in this 80 years on the planet, we have a choice to make of the legacy that we're going to leave and the impact that we're going to have. And you've chosen to help people find their tribe and communicate their message and have an impact. Why? Where did that come from? What, like, talk to me about Rand, the, the little boy. How did this, how did you get to this space? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I totally accidentally fell into this, which I think is how a lot of marketers started just kind of uh, stumbling and finding opportunities. So I, my, my mom and I had started a web design consultancy back in the early 2000s. It was not going well. Uh, we were on the verge of bankruptcy for a long time, couldn't pay our subcontractors even. And so that uh, that is what led me initially to SEO, which is how Moz, uh, the company came about. You know, I started blogging about SEO and then doing consulting and finally building software in that space, uh, but never, intended to be a marketer. I don't think there was a, you know, a point in my journey where I said, yeah, I'm going to be a marketer. I'll go to school for that or I'll study that. It was just a series of falling into lucky accidents and getting interested in the space and then 
um, winding up here. So, um, okay, so you, 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 you're in this web agency uh, with your mum. You, you start to use SEO to bring in leads for your own agency. Then you decide to build a software company, uh, which is Moz. Um, and I, do, I don't want to spend too long talking about Moz because we've spoken about this before. You've written, it's in the book. The, the full history is there for people to go and have a look at. But um, how long was the journey with Moz in total? And, and, and at what point did you, did you say, how, how far were you into Moz where you then said, okay, I'm going to shut off the agency. I'm going to shut off doing consulting and just go all in on software. Uh, yeah, so that was, I think that was 2009. So a couple of years after we took venture capital, the first round of venture. And the reason that we did that is primarily because um, investors who I was pitching for raising us a, a second round essentially told us that they thought our business was mostly a consulting business and therefore they wouldn't fund it. And I felt very strongly that Moz needed to raise another round of financing. Um, and of course it was all BS, like it was a, um, a complete misdirect and probably a mistake. I think, um, you know, companies like Salesforce and HubSpot, plenty of other software businesses have very powerful, useful sort of consulting and support arms. They, they, you know, what they call support is really consulting. And Moz probably should have done the same thing. In fact, in some of the later years, I think just after I stepped down as CEO, uh, Moz started to build a, you know, basically a customer onboarding uh, team that looked very similar to the classic consulting business, but it was paired with the software. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just a silly way of convincing a venture investor that you know, your, your model fits their model. It's all ridiculous. But yeah, at, at the time I was convinced, oh, I have to shut down consulting entirely. I can't have any services revenue. Uh, that, that was pretty dumb. I probably could have used the consulting revenue to keep funding the software business. Mm. Um, we spoke about this at, Ma at our Mavcon event a couple of weeks ago when you came in and spoke to our mastermind members that, um, you kind of mentioned too that it's very easy to get caught up in the BS of Silicon Valley, uh, where you know you end up you end up shutting down something that you really enjoy and something that you love doing because it doesn't fit someone else's agenda or someone else's kind of boilerplate of the kind of business that they'll fund. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I find this to be really a distraction from. What essentially, you know, folks like you and I and, and all of our listeners should be doing, which is building something for our customers and our community. There's no, you know, there's no reasonable reason uh, to take someone else's sort of structure and go with that rather than focusing on what will make your customers happy and what will bring more of them and what will delight your team and employees and what will create a better business for you. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of us sort of bend over backwards and do all these um, mental and business structure gymnastics in order to fit a funding model that is only successful for a very, very small number of businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear you say that, man, because I, I had this conversation many times with, you know, kind of young, enthusiastic entrepreneurs. I think they're going to start a software company and change the world. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, I've never started a software company, uh, but I, I was in a rock and roll band in my 20s and I kind of feel like it's the same thing, like starting a software company, uh, you know, you, you need to be prepared to live on two-minute noodles and, 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 you know, stale bread for a couple of years while you try and hack your way to relevance and in the hope of getting funded. And then, and I read an, a statistic recently that 80% of companies that get Series C funding, that's, so there's usually seed funding, then Series A, then Series B, then Series C. Series C is like significant amounts of funding. You're an established business. 80% of Series C funded companies fail. It is, the odds are just ridiculous. The odds are worse than marriage, right? I mean, the odds are so bad. Uh, and yet I think it's, um, we, it's very easy to get sucked into the, the dream and the kind of aspirations and the, you know, the glamour and the glory of it all. And so it's really good to hear you 
uh, say that from someone who's been through it. Uh, so fast forward to, um, and I'm not going to talk about the way that you exited Moz because I said that's all on public record. People can go and, and read that story for themselves. How long between leaving Moz and starting Spark Toro? What did you do? Did you spend much time kind of reflecting or navel gazing or thinking about, well, who is Rand Fishkin and what is art? Yeah, uh, I, let's see. So I left Moz um, February 28th of 2018. And I, I think I waited almost 14 hours to start Spark Toro. So I, I took a few uh, good hours for myself. <laughs> Fantastic. You no, had a I cup mean, of Troy, tea the reality, and then said, right. Uh, quite honestly, right, one of the things that's, that's very odd that people are always surprised about is, you know, uh, Moz um, was technically a, you know, $50 million a year revenue business and, and you know, um, had a few hundred employees and I had a nice salary while I was there. I, I, I talked about it in my book. I was making uh, almost two out, two, almost $200,000 US a year, right? So I had a nice salary. We had some savings. But when I left, um, I, I did not have health insurance. Like I, I had to like go, go, go get this new company started. Uh, you know, the US is pretty brutal if you, if you don't have um, health care. And so just, you know, I had my severance time from Moz, but I had to spin up and get a new company going and raise money and start being able to pay myself ASAP. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, I couldn't afford it, couldn't have afforded my health insurance and my mortgage and just paying the, the bills uh, generally. So th there was no uh, real opportunity to take take a beat <laughs> and look around. I, I, I could have gone job hunting instead, but I really wanted to prove both to myself and to very frankly, my, you know, my old board of directors that like, I, I could build another great software company. Mm. And so right from the start, you were thinking, uh, we're going to raise funding for Spark Droid. That was deaf. That was on the cards from the get go, right? Yeah, I just didn't didn't have the personal finances to do it myself, um, mm. and mm. I knew that you know the idea for Spark Toro that Casey and I had was going to take Troy at, at least a year minimum, maybe two, to develop and determine whether it was a real product that could really work. That you know, gathering this data was realistic. That um, aggregating it and and sort of anonymizing it and building a tool based on it that all of that was a real, realistic possibility. And very frankly, you know, it was a, it was a reasonable risk. Like I, I wouldn't say for sure that this was something that was going to succeed. We, you know, um, we took a chance and thankfully it paid off, you know, so far it's, we've been live for about uh, 13 months, so a year and a month and it's going well, but oof, you know, those first 18 months were, were high risk. So we talked to investors, actually a lot of folks like yourself and people who are in this uh, community, basically angel investors, many of whom it was their first investment. They'd never invested in a startup before. Um, we're an LLC, mm -hmm. which pays dividends. And our goal is basically to be profitable and to long-term pay out our investors, you know, every year from sort of the, the profits that the company makes, as opposed to this unicorn or bust VC model uh, that I really came to dislike. Mm. Yeah, which is really common. I remember being at a Hacker News meetup in San Francisco, the first time I was in San Francisco, and I walked in and there was like tables of free T-shirts and fridges of free beer and everyone was just having a great time. And I, I was like, wow, there's definitely some money being thrown around here. And it was a, it was a pitch night. It was like people were kind of pitching their ideas. And and uh, I was talking to this one guy who who – couldn't really explain what he was doing, but he was doing like this reverse phone lookup thing. He was like, yeah, you put in someone's, you put in a phone number and we're going to be able to look up and tell you who the phone number belongs to. We, we haven't, we haven't built the technology. We have no idea about the revenue, but we're here, we're going to try We're here in San Francisco to raise some funding. And I'm like, so, so wh what's the business model? Like, how are you going to, how do you, what's the business model? How do you make, raise? no idea. They just wanted to raise some funding so they could build something cool. And I'm like, Wow, that just blows my mind. I mean, I come from the working class suburbs of South Australia and, you know, the idea of 
Like it, it's just a completely, I just don't come from that world where you would try and raise money for something before you've even got, I just would not ask people to give me money unless I knew there was a way of me turning that money into more money for them and for me, right? I mean, I, I, that just doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't, but there, there, I was in a room full of kids basically who had just kind of brought into this, this thing, this like, well, we just go to, we just go to Silicon Valley. We raise some money. We build some cool technology. If people like it, great. If not, then a whole bunch of investors lose their money. I'm like, wow, that's just not the world I come from, but good on them for, for doing that. And, uh, you know, I take my hat off, uh, to them. I just, that's just not, um, me and not where I'm from. Uh, so, uh, now you obviously had a business model in mind when you started Spark Toro. The question is, and obviously that your profile, from Moz and your name uh, lent some credibility to you being able to go and raise some funding. Why Spark Toro as a solution? And we spoke about this at Mavcon, but I'm teeing you up again here to kind of let people know why you felt like the world needed something like Spark Toro. Yeah, I have, uh, Casey and I both have this, this sort of passion around um, being able to help marketers and businesses break free from the the sort of duopoly of Google and Facebook, right? So those two companies own and control the overwhelming majority of uh, advertising spend on the, on the internet, uh, which is becoming the majority of all ad and marketing spend in the world. And also uh, they own and control a ton of how people think about how to do digital marketing. So, you know, whether that's, you know, I'm creating content so it ranks in search engines, I'm you know, promoting things on social media. And one of the tactics that has really fallen by the wayside is thinking outside of those platforms, realizing that there are, you know, communities like this one, that that there are events and webinars and podcasts and uh, press sources and journalists and newspapers, old school and new school and email newsletters and websites and social accounts, all of which are influential in their various spheres to various people, but they are relatively inaccessible to marketers because there's just no way, no reasonable way to figure out what does my audience pay attention to, right? If you want to reach whatever it is, chemical engineers in the UK, or you want to reach, you know, people who play Dungeons and Dragons in Australia, or you're interested in uh, helping domestic violence uh, support groups in the southeast of the United States, how do you reach those people? What do their uh, you know, teams and employees pay attention to? How, how are you going to find them on the web if they're not Googling for exactly what your product is or if they're not already um, you know, captured in your email list or your Facebook group or what have you? And, and the answer is many marketers exist because it's too hard to figure out. And we thought SparkToro, the, the concept behind SparkToro was what if we could instantly identify those for anyone on the web? Um, and thankfully, it turns out like the product worked, which is which is kind of a miracle. And uh, and and I think that's you know that's really down to my co-founder Casey's technical brilliance and ability to get this data, and then the fact that there is finally enough publicly available social and web data about what people follow, read, listen to. You know, we share enough of the. Um, our, our following behavior, our, our content behavior, our uh, you know behavior about which podcasts we listen to and what YouTube channels we subscribe to and subreddits we follow and URLs that we share, all that stuff is now available at enough scale that you can produce a tool like SparkToro. I, I don't think it would have been possible even maybe seven or eight years ago, but it is today. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen and uh, this could uh, this could kill the internet, but I'm going to attempt to share my screen here um, and and bring us both up on the uh, broadcast cool. here, so that you can just walk me through it. Because so Rand, we've had a couple of technical problems. Rand's actually joined in this live stream from his phone, which means we can't share his screen, unfortunately. Um, so let me just share my screen here now. Max, can you bring? Uh, the screen and Rand and I up onto the broadcast. Is that a possibility so that Rand can, at well, well, you know what, Rand at least needs to be able to see what I'm doing. So maybe just the screen 
um, if nothing else, because Rand needs to be able to kind of walk me through how do you spark Toro, right? Um, so I'll leave that up to you, Max. But, yeah. if, but I think the the priority here is if we can see the screen, Max, um, and we can at least hear myself and Rand, that would be great. So our audience are agencies, right? And, um, you know, I'm going to give you some uh, use cases of the – I'm going to give you some typical use cases and then some non-typical or atypical use cases of – customers that we have, clients that we work with that I think might be able to use Spark Toro. So one example is I'm going to give you someone who specializes in helping uh, dentists and the problem that they're solving is most dentists, uh, what they, they don't need clients. They usually have a full practice, but most of those clients are low value, mm. low profit clients, right? What they want is they want the cosmetic stuff. They want the Invisalign cosmetic clients because they're worth fifteen thousand dollars each rather than 250 bucks just to come in and check your fillings right so so if i'm an agency and i'm like okay i do digital marketing seo websites lead capture email marketing funnels all that kind of stuff for dentists how do i how do i where do i how do i find my dentists using spark toro like where are they who do i need to uh, you know, if I was going to start a podcast and interview kind of all the influencers that serve dentists how do i become how do I get into this world pretty quickly? Yeah, so uh, look, I mean, SparkToro is like a lot of research tools in that, you know, it's it's more like a similar web or a survey monkey or type form or something. It is the, the use cases are immensely broad. So when you have a problem to solve demands audience research, right? I need to know whatever the demographics of dentists in the United States. I need to know which podcasts uh, people who talk about cosmetic surgery in Australia are listening to. I need to know um, potentially, you know, what are the biggest sources of local media in the, uh, you know, um, Melbourne area, right? So all of those things could lead to opportunities for doing marketing to potential high revenue, high value dental clients. But, it, but it's really about which of those problems you need to solve. And as an agency, a lot of the times you have problems like that, but um, because it was such a pain in the butt to get that data, you know, you had to survey for it or interview for it or, or do a bunch of random Googling around, um, folks don't do it. So for example, let's say that you one of your agency pitches was to, sure, a maker of Invisalign or a maker of some new version of Invisalign, and you wanna reach a bunch of cosmetic dentists uh, you could type in there so that you can see the drop down in SparkToro. You know, if you click that drop down, uh, there are several options. And one of those options is my audience uses these words in their profile. So you could select that one and then say, you know, my audience uses these words in their profile, um, dentist or cosmetic dentist. And then when you perform a search, SparkToro will look across its database. I'm going to do the search at the same time you are so that we both are hopefully seeing the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. So you search for dentist, just. Yeah, just dentist, yep. Yeah, right. So here's 5,462 people whose profiles uses use that particular word, right? And then you can see what they're talking about. And in fact, quite a few of them are talking about cosmetic dentistry, which, which is, is no surprise, right? And uh, you can scroll down mm -hmm. and see things like, what social accounts do they follow? And what websites do they visit? You can scroll further down and see podcasts that they listen to and press accounts that they read and YouTube channels they subscribe to. Mm. And the nice part about mm. all this data is we give a percentage. So there's no fancy algorithms here. This is grade school division that you're looking at with SparkToro. Like on your screen there, it says whatever, 15.4%. Uh, of dentists who have a public profile in our index, uh, they engage with the podcast Dentistry Uncensored with Howard Parent. I've never heard of that podcast before. I don't know if it's particularly, <laughs> you know, uh, well known outside of the dentistry space. But guess what? Fifteen point four percent—that is a big number. That is a freaking huge number. Yeah. So I, I, I yeah, quite good about the fact that if I were to sponsor that podcast as a maker of whatever dental equipment or cosmetic dentistry equipment or orthodontia, I, I would reach a lot of dentists at least 
um, a, a significant percent who listen to podcasts. That, that that's pretty sweet, right? And if if for example, some dentist client came to you and you know said, like, hey, I want to reach a bunch of other dentists with my new I don't know event, or I'm putting together um, this sort of coalition of uh, you know dental insurance or whatever it is, I want to be in the New York Times. And you could say to them, yeah, mm -hmm. I, you see the New York Times there, fourteen point four percent. So that's a you know that's a decent number, but I think your dollars mm -hmm. would go a lot farther if you put them toward these podcasts and these YouTube channels, and you know if you scroll up some of these social mm -hmm. accounts and websites, like going placing whatever it is, an advertisement or doing a pitch or getting your PR in front of those folks, that that's probably going to be vastly more resonant with the audience you're trying to target than just get in the New York Times. Yeah, 100%. And there's no, like, here's the thing, right? You So now I know this information, I could just go, because I can he already hear people saying, oh, sure, man, but I could just Google dentist podcast. Yes, but before we did this yeah, search in Spark Toro, I didn't even know that there was a dental podcast, right? So the fact that I've done this, the fact that I've done this research in Spark Toro now tells me, oh, there are podcasts, there are YouTube channels, there are social accounts, there are, uh, you know, there are, there are these channels, you know, there's a YouTube channel, the American Dental Association. Well, I wouldn't have thought that the American Dental Association would have a YouTube channel, right? And the fact that I know that 11.3% of dentists are engaging with that, now I can go reach out to these people yeah. and form a relationship with them. So... That's, like I've just shortened my research project right. massively, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, the magic where, there is where, basically not our podcast, right? You can go to Google and search for dental podcasts, but you have no idea how many listeners they have and whether those people are yeah. dentists or people who are in dental school yeah. or are they cosmetic dentists, right? So, you know, you can really drill into a very precise audience here. You could go my audience uses these words in their profile dentist and then add location Australia. And now you can see what Australian dentists mm. listen to uniquely as opposed to, mm. you know, all dentists in the English like speaking world. Um, and when mm. you go and Google that stuff, Google tells you is here's who's good at SEO, not here's That's the right. channels That's and right. sources of that are popular with the audience you're interested in reaching. What's the your database? How how broad is it geographically? Is it mainly concentrated in the US? Uh, it's it's English language, so it has um, decent coverage in you know Australia and and even you know New Zealand, Ireland, um, South Africa. But yes, the the majority of just by virtue of the fact that the English language world is concentrated in US, UK, Canada. Um, that th yeah. those three countries, I would say, make up about 75 percent. And then um, we do have sure. I think we've got a little over a million profiles in Australia. So, you know, a, a reasonable number, but not, you know, not nearly yeah. as many as we do in the U.S. Yeah, good. Um, and, one of the ways uh, you can so always see the, this. Okay, let's just pretend. Is... No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, um, let's pretend that I'm an agency and I have a, uh, I have a, a, you know, a signature system designed to help dentists increase the number of leads coming into their practice for cosmetic work because they're high value leads. I do this research. I find these channels. Um, what in your experience, and I know that I know that this is a slightly different conversation, but in your experience, and obviously you've been exposed to a lot of people using Spark Toro and you've been doing this a long time yourself. What's the low hanging fruit here? Like, what do you like? What would be the first action step? And I've actually got a couple of dental agencies in mind that are in our mastermind program, um, Nicholas. Uh, what would be the first action step for them to go? Cool. How do I get our message in front of these dentists who are wanting more cosmetic um, uh, clients? Uh, is it is it sponsoring a podcast? Is it like putting yourself out as a guest on those podcasts? Is it reaching out to the YouTubers? Is it is it doing like LinkedIn outreach? What's the low hanging fruit do you think for kind of getting traction or even like proving a concept and saying, hey, can I become known as 
the dental marketing agency in Australia in the next six months. Here's like the, here's what I should do in the next two weeks to try and just sort of get some immediate traction. Yeah, I, I feel like um, if it were me, uh, I would be thinking very hard about what is the, what is essentially the reason that um, people pay attention to a various source of influence. And, and if that reason is, hey, I go here to learn about how to look my best self, right? So it, it could be, you know, if you are, someone who's trying to help a dentist reach potential cosmetic dentistry patients, that's very different from someone trying to help someone reach dentists, right? So instead, mm -hmm. I would try and think about, you know, I, th I think that uh, my, my favorite tool for this is sort of an influence map, which is something that in behavioral psychology, they use a lot. So a behavior psychologist says, mm -hmm. what influences this group of people and how can we nudge their behaviors? Right, so you might say, oh, well, people who are interested in cosmetic dentistry for themselves, they also tend to, um, I don't know whether, you know, maybe it's read um, dermatology publications or they follow a particular social influencer or they use the hashtag, um, uh, you know, skincare or something like that. And then you could say, oh, these are the sources of influence for these people. Now your next job, right? So let's try it, right? Let's try, you know, my audience frequently uses the hashtag skincare, right? And, and that group of people pays attention to certain sources. And as a cosmetic dentist, you say, I want to get in front of this same audience because I know that they tend to be high net worth individuals who are willing to pay a lot of money, to look their absolute best. Mm -hmm. And so where can I... Uh, where can I reach them? And then you go down and you see something like Allure magazine. And, and now the next question as a marketer is, what could a dentist do to be in Allure magazine? And, and that could very well be, hey, we're going to pitch them a piece about how it does not matter how great your fashion sense is, how good your skin is, how amazing your bone structure is, <laughs> if your teeth aren't in you, you're not going to look the way you want to look. And so here are, you know, whatever, 10 tips from, you know, uh, Australia's leading dentist, uh, cosmetic dentist, Dr. So-and-so, and we're, we're going to pitch them on that article. And maybe Allure isn't going to pick it up, but maybe Marie Claire will, or maybe Mind Body Green will, yeah. or maybe uh, we got Inspirations and Celebrations will, or whatever it is, right? Organic Spa Magazine. They might very well pick that up, right? It's a, mm. it's a unique type of piece. It's not something they cover all the time. There's probably not a whole not not a whole lot of cosmetic dentists pitching them. You you've got an opportunity, right? And you can click, you know, you can click into this social tab and basically scroll down, um, and see. Yeah, if you click on the social tab on the left or or see all social results, um, you know, you'll see tons of opportunities. And then I think your job as a marketer is really to say. Yeah who will amplify my message and why and if you have a great answer to that so you can start like, doing the pitches in the right way but doesn't try to be prescriptive about that yeah this is like the this is like the modern version of pr right what we're talking about right here is you know the modern marketing agency that does seo and runs ads also needs to be doing pr because SEO and ads are just becoming so competitive and so expensive. And this, you know, building relationships with, with channels that, as you say, amplify, can amplify your message. And I don't want to use the word influencer marketing uh, because, you know, that conjures up all sorts of weird images of 42-year-old mums in their bikinis on Instagram, um, which is something you can't unsee. Uh, but, the, you know, the, this, is, this, is a, this is a critical part. Of, we haven't even talked about custom audiences yet, but this is a critical part of, of um, the, the modern marketing agency, I think, needs to be paying attention to this kind of, this is like old school PR, right, where, where you're using traditional media outlets to amplify your message. How, how can... I noticed this custom audience, I haven't explored it, but I noticed you've got custom audiences. How can we, 
uh, integrate what we learn here in Spark Toro into, for example, if we're running ads for clients, how can we take what we learn here and integrate that into a traditional uh, paid advertising campaign? Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest one, right, the most straightforward is on this social tab or on the websites tab or the text insights tab, you can see, you know, whatever, sources of influence or words and phrases or uh, websites that are popular with a given audience. And then you can plug those right into your Google display or your YouTube advertising or your Facebook advertising, your Instagram advertising, Twitter advertising, LinkedIn, if you're doing a lot of B2B, in fact, the LinkedIn advertising platform is and, and Twitter are really built for tomorrow because without them, I don't know how you'd ever discover which, you know, which uh, sources you should advertise against and which audiences you should target. But, you know, you that um, just programmatic ads on display networks and, and social networks is a huge use case for SparkToro. I think almost a third of our customers basically just have their paid, you know, search, social and content uh, um, advertising teams using SparkToro to just inform which ads they wow. go after, which audience they target. I don't know wow. if you've used like Facebook ads recently, Troy. Like the interface is so bad, it just won't suggest anything to you. You know, they've taken away so much of the data that used to be in Facebook Insights after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And so SparkToro is kind of bringing yes. a lot of that affinity data back. Yeah, I pay other people to run my Facebook ads because the interface is, uh, hurts my eyes. Um, I used to do it many, many moons ago, uh, but I gave up uh, on that a long time ago because it's not my wheelhouse. Um, where, where does this not work? Who is Spark Toro? I just want to be clear with, with my audience that because um, they have shiny objects in yeah. mind, let's be, let's be honest. Who does, who does this not work for? Where have you seen this not work? I... Yeah, yeah. So um, I like to say my 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 old my go to example is SparkToro is great if you are targeting real estate agents, right? If you want to influence real estate agents, they have a consistent set of you know sources online that they pay attention to, and publications, and events, and all that kind of stuff. Versus if you want to target homeowners or home buyers, they don't. Home buyers don't say you know, on their Instagram profile or their, their Twitter page or their LinkedIn, I'm shopping for a home right now. They just don't say that. So it's going to be really difficult to reach those kinds of people because they don't self-describe in a way that could be potentially targetable versus, yeah, a, a real estate agent, right? Dentists are very easy to reach. People who are interested in skincare are easy to reach. People who just need standard dentistry, that's every human being. Every human being, right, with a dental insurance needs needs dentistry. You're you're gonna have a much more difficult time finding them in SparkToro, right? That's just all of humanity. So, um, so it it tends to be very good when you've got a very specific targeted group of people who have distinct online behavior, and it's not great when you don't. It's also not great outside of English. And <laughs> excellent. Thanks for the uh, the uh, clarity there. Um, so I've just typed in lawyer, and which is a very broad topic, right? We have a couple of uh, members who target specific types of lawyers. So how do I drill down? I, I go broad. I, I go tell me lawyers. I got forty one thousand six hundred people in the in the in the uh, uh, in the database with lawyer in their profile. I can see here some top words in bios: criminal, trial, future lawyer, husband. Perfect. Interesting. Um, <laughs> how do I? How do I so now drill you, down? Is it is it just through, is it just through the, the the kind of the like the text insights and like drilling more into the filters? I would do exactly that. I would click into that see all the the text insights link that's right below. Oh. Uh, what is that husband? Right, and then essentially yeah, when yeah. you click in there, it will show you uh, words like oh. Okay, corporate attorneys, right? Corporate lawyers, that I that's who I'm going after. Or a defense attorney, or a criminal defense attorney, mm -hmm. or an injury attorney, an employment attorney, an immigration attorney. You can you can go mm -hmm. take any of those, click on immigration lawyer, for example, and SparkToro has data on 561 uh, immigration lawyers 
And so that will sort of tell you, oh, hey, you know, we have a new whatever streamlined process for helping you through U.S. Customs and Immigration or um, for, uh, you know, people who are applying for particular programs. Great. We want to pitch exactly those people. Where, where do we reach them? Oh, perfect. Here's where I can reach immigration attorneys online. Here's what they listen to, watch, follow, et cetera. And yeah, you can, you know, if you know already the words and phrases to reach your audience or you know sources that they already pay attention to or hashtags that they uh, use in their, in their updates or follow, great. You can just type those in directly. And if you don't know, you can do what we did and start broad and then drill in. Got it. Uh, this is super interesting. This is another actual real case, real uh, case study of one of our members who targets immigration lawyers in the states, uh, which is why I brought that idea up. Um, um, how do you? What's the? I want to talk about agency in a moment in terms of like using like reselling Spark Toro. But the other thing I want to talk about is how do you? How do you? Can you collaborate with your team in Spark Toro? Like if I had another team member. I wanted to come in and we wanted to like do some searches and save some ideas. Like, how do we do that? In Can we do that in Spark Toro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of folks do, do two things. One, you can invite a ton of people to your account. You know, the um, with the paid accounts, you can you can invite anyone you like. And certainly it's it's also a forever free account that you can set up. So some folks can run their own searches. But basically, yeah, if you um, are in SparkToro and you want to start kind of collaborating on a list, you can just start building lists by checking the boxes next to any source or next to any, um, huh. essentially, n next to any text instance you want and add them to a list, right? So yeah, as you're, as you're right. in this search for immigration lawyer, right, you can click on the, yep, and then there's little boxes next to there and you can check yeah, and yeah. say like, oh yeah, yeah, I want to go after you know, whichever, whichever terms and phrases you're doing for your, uh, you know, Google ads or your uh, content campaign or your, um, you know, advertising campaign, your social media marketing campaign, your PR, whatever, you just check, 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 check. And then you click add to list, um, which is right up at the top there, scrolls down with you and you can then build a list. I have like a hundred lists in my <laughs> in mine, everything from like oh bariatric surgery sort of influence to uh, Bondi Sands, which I think is an Australian fashion retailer, and you know where where are they going to reach their yeah. you know next thousand customers and all this you know um, type of stuff. So you can build those lists in there, collaborate on them. You can export the data to CSV for whatever you want to do, um, and there's uh, plenty of agencies of all sizes, you know, five person agencies and 50 person agencies who use Spark Tour in exactly that way. Got it. And then um, talk to me about custom audiences. What are, what are custom audiences designed to do? How, how does this help your Spark Toro plan? Yeah, so custom audiences is uh, one of the more advanced features. It's available at the, the higher tier. And um, essentially what you can do is you can take a set of email addresses, um, push it through something like full contact or um, Clearbit, get social URLs, so social account URLs, whatever, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, for those individuals, or you could custom craft it, right? You could go straight to Twitter and, and be like, I want these 500, you know, Twitter's people's profiles. Uh, and then you upload that to our custom audiences and we'll analyze exactly the the social urls that you want the people and profiles that you send us like an audience um, that you've searched for and so we, you know we had someone my favorite example of this recently was um there's a what, what do i want to call them they're sort of a, a data consultant for all sorts of businesses here in the us but they specifically work with a lot of folks in the entertainment industry and there was this TV show, which unfortunately I'm not allowed to share which one it was, but there was a TV show that was that was getting canceled. And they this data consultant wanted to use Spark Toro to help the um, the TV production, the, the director and the producer um, pitch that TV show to another network, you know, to Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, all these kinds of people. Uh -huh. And so what happened was they took they took the audience of people who were subscribed to updates about the TV show, 
sent them through, I think it was full contact, got their social URLs, and then custom analyzed them to be able to show a bunch of demographic, psychographic, behavioral data to the networks in their pitch deck, right? For, hey, this is why you should pick up our TV show, because if you do, you will capture this audience that you are not currently capturing. Wow. Wow, super that's cool, amazing. Right? <laughs> super, super cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Um, uh, one thing before I get to agency plans, what's audience intelligence? The audience intelligence is the core tool. That's essentially what um, where you're doing all of your audience research, you're doing your searches. So when you click on right. audience intelligence, um, that will take you to the primary search interface where you can start you know, whatever right. it is, doing your research, building your list, getting all your exports. We cool, cool. We might be changing the name of that, Troy, it's audience research, to be honest. Okay. okay. Um, I'm an agency. How do I, how do I many, how do I do this for clients? How do I use Spark Toro for my clients? Yeah. Or like, do I resell it? Do I set them up with their own account? How does that work? Probably not. I, I would advise, I mean, for most agencies, you you and your team are going to be far more sophisticated about marketing and PR and sources of influence and how to do all this stuff than your client will be. So by all means, you know, do the searches for them, copy and paste the data, format it however you want, put it into your own CSV and turn it into your own charts and graphs if you want, or just screenshot the ones that are right in SparkToro and paste them into your PowerPoint. That That works for a lot of folks too. But I don't, I don't think I would advise you to sort of be like, hey, let's invite our dentist, you know, to come take a look at SparkToro. Yeah. You could walk them through it in a meeting. It might, it might be fine for them. But it, I think it's a little bit um, over their head sometimes in terms of, hey, sure. why are we doing this? And like, what, what's the reason for this? And can you explain all the data behind it? You know, your listeners who are savvy marketers and agency owners, they'll be able to explain that to their teams. They'll have an understanding of like, well, you know, they crawl, whatever it is, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and they aggregate all these profiles together and then they show the behavior of it. And that makes sense to us. I, I'm not sure your dentist yeah. client is gonna get that. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, but I can have, I, I can have, I can set up multiple accounts within Spark Toro, is that right? So I can have like, I can log into a, an account for a specific client Absolutely. You can set up multiple accounts. You can invite different people to the account. You can have permissions about who's sort of an admin versus a, um, you know, an individual in the account. It, it's it's all available. It, that's all. Yeah, through that that link you clicked in the top right, where you've got your uh, initials yeah. in there. You yeah. can just go to use settings in there, and then yeah. you'll be able to. Oh, sorry, uh, account settings, and then you'll be able to invite yeah. invite people. Uh, through your account settings. Got it. Um, uh, how much does it cost? What is uh, what are the what are the what's the current uh, uh, cost of uh, Spark Toro? Uh, I mean, the cool part is it's it, we have a forever free account, so you get you know a bunch of searches. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's five searches every month, and you know sample data. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people just that. I think we have almost forty thousand people, forty thousand marketers who are just using the free version every month which is great. And then, you know, when you have a bigger need or you run a query and you think, oh man, I, I need this for my client or my team or, you know what, this is gonna be worth, you know, a bunch to me. Great, you can sign up for um, the, the account plan start at 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Cool, awesome. I'll say monthly and there's obviously a bit of a discount if you, uh, if you pay annually. Sweet, and sparktoro.com yeah. is where people go uh, to, uh, to get amongst it. Um, where can people also follow the journey of Rand Fishkin? Is it just is it just randfishkin.com? You're still actively blogging over there? I think I redirected randfishkin.com actually to SparkToro. So uh, the SparkToro blog is where I publish both personally and professionally. Um, although I, I am certainly also uh, very active on Twitter where I'm at Randfish. And yeah, I've been uh, a little slow in personal updates last month. My uh, my old company, Troy Moz, um, sold last month, and it, it's been a sort of 
crazy journey and then spark toro's growing like a weed and um gotta update our will <laughs> gotta gotta you know reach out and uh and top up some if you got missed the deal so uh it's been it's been an adventure this last month for sure yeah but how, how did it feel most sold to eye contact is that right did, did i read that is, is that did i read that right um, so Moz sold to a Canadian holding company called uh, J2. They own they own a bunch of different companies, including Eye Contact. Right. All oh, right, got it. Um, how did that feel when when Moz sold? Um, gosh, uh, it was very unexpected. You know, they're they're. Um, I don't know, just hard to describe. Like it was one of those, hey, remember that thing you worked on for 17 years? Uh, it's come to an end and you're know, and and you not allowed to talk about it because you have to sign this NDA. Um, and so that was one of those like, oh, I have lots of emotions and feelings and um, they span all across the spectrum, uh, but it it is uh, it, it's been frustrating for sure not not being able to really like talk about it publicly. That's um, that's hard for me. You know, I love to be transparent. So I don't know. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, sometime in the okay. future that'll expire and I'll be able to to be a little bit more public about um, my experience there because yeah. I think it really is interesting for a lot of players to like to know what that journey is like mm. and to, and then actually see this one come to a close. Mm. Um, I know I said this at Mavcon, but I'm going to say it here because there's a, this is a, a, a bit of a more of a public audience here, but I've been such a huge fan of yours for such a long time. And I'm not just saying this to blow smoke up your ass, as we say here in Australia. Um, I'm saying this genuinely because there have been many times over the last, I don't know, 10 years uh, since I started watching your Whiteboard Fridays, uh, when, whenever that was, uh, there's been so many times over the last 10 years or so that I've, you know, that you you kind of you, you kind of think you know how, how am I relevant? What is the point? No one's listening. There's no engagement, and I keep coming back to the, you know there's a there's a handful of people that have just inspired me over the years to keep going in the face of irrelevance, right? <laughs> and and you've you've been one of those people that has just kept putting out content and kept leading and kept inspiring and uh, you know. And so I just want to thank you publicly for, uh, as I can publicly in a private Facebook group, uh, thank you publicly for all the work that you've done um, uh, over, you know, however long you've been doing this, because you have inspired uh, many, many entrepreneurs. I mean, I, when I was running the agency, we used to talk about your whiteboard Fridays. We used to watch them together and talk about them as a team. And uh, on, and I want you to know that you've had an incredible impact on many people around the world. And, uh, and thank you for everything that you do and, and keep doing. And I wish you all the best with Spark Toro. And I'm really looking forward to the travel restrictions being relaxed here and Australia getting our shit together and vaccinating everyone so that I can come back to the States and travel again because I would love to hang out with you and take you out for dinner, man. Uh, one day that would, that would be uh, something I would love to, uh, to tick off my list. So thanks again for everything you do and I wish you right. all the best for Spark Toro. And, also, and thank you for, for, for persisting with the technical difficulties we've had today, man. I, I know it's been uh, challenging, but I want to thank you again for that my pleasure uh, it was a uh, great to join you again troy and uh i look forward to doing this in person maybe we can you know set up a camera and have some have some uh high fidelity tech broadcast the next time we do this yes that would be awesome that would be great all right thank you very much uh ladies and gentlemen that is the one and only rand fishkin go check out sparktoro.com uh and uh sign up for a free account take it for a spin and reach out to rand and say good day and say thank you uh for all the work that he's continuing to do all right i'm gonna go and cough my lungs up now i've been suppressing it for the last hour i'm gonna go and get rid of this and and go and have a bit of a rest and fully recover i hope this has been helpful for you leave some comments under the video let us know who you'd like to see next or what you'd like to learn next in the group uh, i'll see you all again very soon until then i'm troy dean go elevate